Well, this is a, a passage and a half, isn't it? Um, I don't know if you followed it all, if you're familiar with the back end of the book of Daniel. If you grew up in Sunday school, you're probably very familiar with the first six chapters of Daniel, where there are lion's dens and fiery furnaces and what not to eat when you go to university. I think that was a favorite freshers passage when I was a university student. It's even the book that we get the phrase, the writing on the wall from. And if that were not enough, it includes a chapter that Jesus himself references more than almost any other Old Testament chapter as he reveals himself as the divine son of man and talks about the ancient of days as well. But here in chapter 10, we're taken into a biblical realm that's rarely spoken of in the rest of the canon, a realm that's revealed to one man, Daniel. Now, Daniel is an extraordinary Old Testament character who survives dynasty after dynasty. Here in chapter 10, he's with King Cyrus of Persia. Previous chapter, he's with Darius, and we've already heard from Charlie that he was around with Nebuchadnezzar as well. He has gone through various dynasties, more even than that, and ascends to high prominence under successive emperors in every single regime. If you know the story of Joseph, it's not unlike his, how he keeps ascending. Fearlessly, he speaks the word of God throughout his life. And our chapter 10, which is our main passage for today, follows fast on the heels of chapter 9, and that has similarities. So turn back with me to chapter 9. Chapter 9 moves from a revelation given to Daniel in Holy Scripture that the exile that he's been enduring his entire life from the age of 14 to now is only to last for 70 years. And we understand from this that Daniel is probably about 82, 83 years of age at the time. And that, contrary to some of our children's uh, picture book Bibles, is probably around the sort of age that he was when he's chucked into the lion's den. I don't know about you, but I always had the image of him looking a bit like Charlie when he was chucked into the lion's den. You know, mature, but not too mature. That sort of, uh, that sort of stage of life. And, um, and uh, chucked in there, and the, you know, he could probably have fed off the lions if he needed to, but actually, he's a seriously old man when he's chucked into that pit and survives. This is a man who's been tested through a long time. And, um, and we, we wonder what it is that uh, Daniel has been reading. Um, it, it moves from revelation given in Scripture to revelation given to him by the archangel Gabriel, who comes and tells him truths. By the end of the chapter, you'll see that the archangel, who's made famous to us by the Christmas stories... Uh, announcing the coming of Jesus to various people left, right, and center, is already in Daniel chapter 9, announcing the nativity. Hundreds of years, hundreds of years before a baby was born in Bethlehem. So what has Daniel been reading that leads him to meet an archangel in this way? Well, in the book of Jeremiah, which we hear he has been reading, in chapter 25, 10 to 14, and 29, 10 to 14, he predicts that the captivity of desolation of Jerusalem will last for 70 years. And there's also a strong possibility that that Daniel will have known of the book of Isaiah, where Isaiah names Cyrus as the one who would permit the Jews to return. That's Isaiah 44, verses 28 through 51, verse 1. And Daniel may have looked at some of the other Messianic Passages as well in Scripture like Leviticus 26 or 1 Kings 8 or Jeremiah 3 or Hosea 5. My personal favorite when I was at university was 2 Chronicles 7, 13, 14. If my people will humble themselves and pray, then I will hear from heaven. At the earlier service, I got that quote wrong, so I'm quite glad that I got through that one this time. Uh, but if you, I'll hear from heaven and I'll restore the land. If my people will humble themselves and pray... And what does Daniel do? He humbles himself and prays. He understands from Scripture that this horrible exile he's endured his entire life is only to last 70 years, and it's year 69. God, what are you going to do? What Daniel does is praise a glorious five-paragraph prayer in the NIV, a petition that comes in fasting, in sackcloth and ashes, and the answer is immediate and on the lips of an archangel that he's already met. Uh, Have a look at verse 20 and 21. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, not just his sin, but the sin of those around him, the sin from decades before mainly, and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I'd seen in the earlier vision, 
came to me swift in flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. And Gabriel says, Daniel, I've now come to give you insight and understanding. And look at verse 23 again. As soon as you began to pray, a word went out which I've come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. That's chapter 9. Chapter 10 is not like that. This time it starts not with searching the scriptures, not with Jeremiah's famous prophecy, I know the plans I have for you, but with a personal revelation given to him in a vision that there will be a great war. This revelation was obviously disturbing, and his reaction once more, as in chapter 9, was fasting, fasting. Verse 2 of chapter 10, at that time I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions until all the three weeks were over. I I don't know what lotions were available to him, what he felt was necessary, beauty products or other things, but uh, as in many times in fasting, he he decides not to uh, cover up in such a way. And we read that he also set his mind to gain understanding and to humble himself before God. That's verse 12. While offering words that could be heard in heaven, which is what we call prayer. He's praying with a capital P. He's humbling himself. He's trying to get revelation and insight and he's fasting. So let's pause for a moment and think about fasting. Notice how natural it is for Daniel to turn to fasting when he needs spiritual breakthrough. I wonder if it's part of your spiritual armor, your spiritual repartee here as an individual or as a church at All Souls. For Daniel, it was essential. I can remember early things form you, don't they, in these things. I remember being at school for a school dinner, and my dad was a teacher at my school down in Worthing. And I spotted that he was at the table but not eating one day. And I was like, Dad, why aren't you eating Uh, the delicious, horrible salmonella sort of stuff that we were eating, spam or whatever? And the answer wasn't that the food's horrible. The answer was, I'm trying to make a big life decision. So I'm fasting. He gave a simple explanation to a question. wasn't parading it around, but gave a simple explanation. It formed me as an 11, 12-year-old that my father was doing that. If you do uh, uh, embark in fasting, uh, notice it's wise to get good counsel on how to do it. It's vital you do it with God and not just for God, allowing the Holy Spirit to sustain you as he sustained Jesus in his wilderness when he was fasting. But I have to say, when I go around with, with Soma around the world, fasting is just a very, very normal part of how churches seem to grow and break through. If I'm in Africa or Asia or the Middle East among Muslim background believers, they would think it unbelievable that the church in England only fasts a few bits of chocolate during Lent, (laughs) Uh, while their Islamic brothers and sisters do Ramadan to extremes. (laughs) I remember at university as a fresher up in Cambridge uh, deciding that I would try and do Ramadan for praying for, for Muslims around the world, 40 days of breakthrough, and uh, ended up making myself incredibly ill because I had no idea of how to take care of myself. So I could only feed myself before and after dusk, and the canteen wasn't open. So in the morning, I had cornflakes, and the evening, I had pasta with tomato ketchup and uh, mayonnaise on it, and unsurprisingly enough, was ill after two weeks. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the way to do it. Uh, But nevertheless, it's part of the school of faith. And fasting is a key part of our apparatus. The scripture suggests that we as Christians will fast. When the bridegroom has been taken away from us, then you will fast as Jesus. And as we await with longing his restoration of all things at the second coming, so we fast too. And can I say, hopefully humbly, if you know nothing of fasting, there is a high chance you know little of prayer. And it is a straightforward shortcoming to rectify. Just start with missing one meal and praying until you build up your spiritual wings enough to do it a little bit more. Let's look then at the answer that comes after this fasting. Daniel fasts, and we read that since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and an incredible angel was sent in response to them. Did you you see the depiction of the angel in uh, verses uh, 6 especially? This fine man 
uh, with a body like topaz, face like lightning, eyes like flaming torches, arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. And imagine what that was like to encounter this extraordinary angelic being. But note that since the first day, at, at the beginning of that response, because you'll see that this mighty angelic being, powerful as he was, with a voice like the multitudes, took a full three weeks to get to Daniel. He took three weeks to get to him. He was dispatched on day zero, and it took 21 days to get there. So why? Is it because the Lord had a delayed railway service or heavenly aeroplane was gone wrong? Is it because the people were on strike, like the tubes are on strike today, and we had to get on our line bikes to get here, or however you made your way to central London today? No, it's not that. It's because of a new character in our saga, a mighty adversary who is combated ultimately by a victorious ally of Daniel's and of this angel, but both of whom we see without explanation in verse 13. So have a look at verse 13. The prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. This is the angel speaking. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. So who are these princely beings? Well, the prince of Persia seems to refer by title to one of the princes and principalities that Paul in the New Testament tells Christians about in Ephesians chapter 6. The ones that we learn our battle as believers in Christ are against the ones who are not flesh and blood. They are the troops of our enemy, the devil who the New Testament says wants to devour us. You've got to imagine that this is one of the passages that inspired C.S. Lewis into his screw tape letters with his hierarchy of those sort of demonic forces there. This particular prince is called the Prince of Persia and seems to have had sufficient authority and jurisdiction in and over Persia in order to prevent a lower level angel from getting to Daniel without help. But God will not be thwarted and help is dispatched in the form of a chief prince this one who is on the side of Daniel and his angelic messenger. Now, this chief prince is none other than the archangel Michael himself, the second of two archangels to feature in the whole of Scripture and in the book of Daniel itself. We know from the New Testament, the book of Jude, that this chief prince, archangel Michael, once successfully combated the devil with the words, the Lord rebuke you. The devil was himself, most likely another fallen angel, Lucifer, which means angel of light. And so against the, the mere prince of Persia, Archangel Michael is once again ultimately successful. And you'll see that we learn at the beginning of the next chapter that he is considered to be the prince of the Jewish people, Michael as the prince of the Jewish people. Meanwhile, Daniel is just fasting and praying blissfully unaware of all this cosmic battle that's going on. He's weeping his heart out on the floor, resisting his lotions, resisting food, resisting everything, just continuing to pray that God would restore the honor of his name. Now, prayer, answer, delays are something that is worth us pausing on here. In Daniel chapter 9, the answer was immediate, was it not? But in Daniel chapter 10, the answer is delayed because of this mighty angelic battle that Daniel has no awareness of at all is happening. Now, you may have heard many a good sermon say that God's answers to prayers are always yes, no, or wait. Have you heard that? The traffic lights talk, you know, it's, it's red, green, or amber. But here we find out that there's a three-week delay before the traffic lights even comes on. <laughs> There's not been an answer. There's not a red, green, or amber. At this point, there's just nothing. The traffic light's blank like it is sometimes on the high road. You're like, ah, oh, I can't move. What do I do? And Daniel's response to the traffic light's not being on at all is just to keep pressing on in prayer. Sometimes prayers are delayed for reasons we're rarely privileged to understand. When there is a delay in answer to prayers, we're invited to do P-U-S-H. Do you remember those wristbands that used to be in vogue 20 odd years ago? People would put them on their, on their wrists along with, uh, I can't remember what the other one was, it frog or something like that. Um, and what would Jesus do? W-W-J-D. And, and P-U-S-H stood for pray until something, a few people saw them, pray until something happens. And that's the advice of Daniel. I haven't had a response to this vision, Lord, so I'm going to stay on the floor 
until I hear a response from you. And then he got his prayer answer. Let's consider it from the perspective of the angel talking to Daniel, this extraordinary being who, when, a da- when he first touches Daniel and speaks to him, uh, causes him to, to become deathly pale and go into a deep sleep. And when he speaks to him the second time, strengthens him and revitalizes him. Well, it turns out that even angels as majestic and marvelous as this one is need partners when faced with entrenched demonic opposition. The angel, we learn, is also due to face the prince of Greece again, and he's going to need the archangel Michael's help for that. That's verses 20 to 21. Persia and Greece were the regional superpowers of the time that threatened the very existence of God's people. It seems demonic superpowers accompanied and perhaps personified and motivated their human cultural hosts. Turns out that even angels need partners when faced with entrenched demonic opposition. How much more Daniel? And how much more us as well, who know that our battle is not against flesh and blood? We're not supposed to wage these wars on our own. But let's pause for for another time to think about cosmic battles. Because this chapter in the Bible is quite, quite unusual, not completely unique, but very unusual. And thinking about angels and heavenly battles may be hard for us to get our head around. They're certainly not supposed to be a distraction to us from the glory of Jesus Christ. Think of Hebrews chapter 1 for that, which explains how much more majestic Jesus is than all of the angels and archangels you could imagine. Nor are they a thing for us to seek after as an experience. Think about how Paul shies away from telling the Corinthians about his own surpassing revelations in the seventh heavens. But Wallace, in his BST notes, that's the Bible Speaks Today notes, he notes that angels seem to have a providential charge to care for God's people and to fortify and encourage Daniel in this instance. And Joyce Baldwin, in her commentary, emphasizes that God is in control above all these forces and battles to the very degree that God himself can accurately foretell what the future will be after these angels, archangels, demons, and princes, and powers, and their human counterparts have all weighed in with their battles. God may well, this this book tells us, work to mediate his purposes through angels, and that may be happening all the time, as this glimpse into the heavenlies seems to indicate. But the take-home point for us is that it is God who is in control. Amen? It is God who answers prayer. Amen? It's God who sends the angels. Amen? It's God who sends the archangels to back them up, and it is God whose purposes will not be thwarted. Ultimately, all of the Scripture breathes his name, and it points us to Jesus. But if angels need help, as I've said, so do we. And um, I think in our human counterparts, as they had in theirs, Uh, we can sometimes act like angels or archangels to each other. I'd like to affirm and value All Souls Langham Place today as a a partner that has acted a bit like an archangel to the angels of the other churches. Remember how Revelations 1 through 3 talks about the angels of the churches, and in some ways All Souls has operated like an archangel with a ministry beyond your borders uh, to the global church. Uh, An example was on Thursday... I was in my little prayer hut in my, in my garden, uh, which I borrowed from uh, something I saw at Lee Abbey in Devon. And I was reading the book of Job. And I realized I didn't understand uh, the book of Job. Anyone been there? <laughs> I was reading chapter 35, where a, a young guy who's cocky and arrogant called Elihu is, is answering Job. And I was trying to work out what's this all about. So I, I turned, uh, when I was walking my dog, to, to YouTube and, and had a look on, on a particular Bible uh, app there, and I, I, I discovered I didn't think they knew what they were talking about. So I then flicked on All Souls Langham Place Sermon Archive and discovered this glorious uh, talk by a guy called David Turner, who I understand is in Ireland today. Uh, and it was magisterial, magnificent, a stunning exposition of the questions that were going through my head, mentoring me uh, 19 years after he first preached it. <laughs> While I walked around Chiswick House Park, it's a wonderful thing. And this church, we've already talked about how 
Uh, from this church came out people who replanted our church before church planting was a thing that people talked about all the time. Encouraging, building legacies. I can remember being in Bristol once when uh, at Theology College back in the early 2000s and uh, John Stott had come to, to talk on one of, his, one of his, maybe his 80th birthday tour, I'm not even sure. And I, I managed to get you know, a few seconds with him and I was like, uh, I, I wasn't really an Anglican by background and, uh, and I said to him, uh, dear, dear, dear Mr. Stott, sir, um, uh, do you do curacies at All Souls? And, and he looked at me, you know, waved me up very, very quickly. And he was like, no way. <laughs> we only do second curacies. But you can, you can listen to my books. Uh, you can listen to my tapes and you can read my books. And, you know, that's, that's what I've done down the years. Legacy. Like an archangel to us. And we all need those who can provide us with help. Uh, and yet, at the middle of this story is not a superpower in Daniel, but an old man, a weak old man. I don't know if you've tried fasting for three weeks, but you're not at the top of your game, <laughs> spiritually, emotionally, physically sometimes. You go through all sorts of things. Remember how Jesus was tempted after 40 days of fasting? <laughs> yeah, that's when he was at his weakest. And if the hapless angel needs a powerful partner in Archangel Michael, so it seems that God chooses to work with a far less powerful partner, Daniel. Let's think about Daniel. A man who could only offer his utter near-starving weakness as he poured out his prayers in response to disturbing dreams and violent visions. A man honed in the school of obedience who had stood up to tyrants all his life. A man whose religious routine of prayer five times a day at his window had recently meant that this non-retired pensioner spent a night in a den of lions. A man who had already seen angels shut those same lions. God looks for partners like Daniel. People who are prepared to be less so that he can be more. And in some ways, as I go around the, the world now, our biggest gift as a church in England is not the amazingness of our theology. <laughs> it's not the stunningness of our faith. It's not the story of our remarkable spiritual disciplines. Our greatest gift to the global church is to say, we're weak. We've reached our dotage, which is a lovely phrase, but we're going a little bit senile. We've forgotten the truths that we once knew. They used to say that the church in Africa was a mile wide and an inch deep, but now that's true of England. And the church in Africa has got more deep PhDs and other things than has ever been tried here. A mountain that we go to in Uganda, where we take people regularly, is in uh, South Ruanzori Diocese in Kasesi. And we were there a couple of years ago. I took my daughter, she was 14, and we went to visit. That was a beautiful time. Do you know, they, they have a mountain in Kasesi, that one bishop bought, another one planted with trees, and another one said, we should make this into a prayer mountain. Every first, second, or third Friday of the month, 10,000 people go up this prayer mountain. Guess what they're praying for? Everything north of them. Islamic, Africa, pagan Europe, and London, England. <laughs> Mountain of the Lord, fasting for the day, praying that we might be faithful, that we might be true to the deposit that we first brought to them. God's always looking for partners who know they're weak. A returning missionary here at All Souls Langham Place was a man called George Ingram. He was here in the 50s and 60s. I heard about him from John Collins when I was researching John in 2017, and he said that George, who had named Paget Wilkes, who was one of the great missionaries from Japan, who had a really deep inner life with the Lord, a really almost mysterious life with the Lord, been I mean, incredibly impacted by, pa by Paget Wilkes. And George would stand at the back of the church there and smile at and encourage curates like Collins on the way out with, good lad, you know you're called cool for this, don't you? When he felt weak, having had to stand in the same pulpit as some of the people who stood in this pulpit down the years. But he would also say, but you know there's more... <laughs> There's more than you're currently experiencing, don't you? There's more to this Christian life than you're living out now. And in the 1960s, Ingram 
uh, mobilized people all around the country to have nights of prayer for worldwide revival. One of them happens in Gillingham, which if, if you don't know where Gillingham is, it's in Kent. Kent's called the Garden of England, and Gillingham's known as the compost heap of, uh, of Kent. And uh, Stott had sent Collins there as a curate to see if what was happening here at All Souls could happen just in a normal place as well. And, and actually it did through personal evangelism and others. The, the church there grew exponentially with people like David Watson and David McGuinness, curates, living in the vicarage with the vicar. Um, Corrie Ten Boom came to visit, who's uh, famous from uh, that forgiveness story that you can find on the Alpha course and other places. Uh, and she told them to don't wrestle, just nestle, to learn how to lean into the Lord and, and receive from the Lord. Uh, and then they had this night of prayer for revival, and it came out of a place where they were, actually, my Christian life is, is st stalemate. The church has grown, <laughs> the ministry is expanding, but my inner life is a problem. Anyone ever been there? Outwardly, you look great. <laughs> Inwardly, you know that you're a whitewashed tomb. And Collins would go away every week to pray about this problem. He'd read in Romans 6 that he was dead to sin <laughs> and read the rest of the week and going, I'm not dead to sin, but the Bible says I'm dead to sin. Why am I not dead to sin? And so some people came and knocked on the door of the vicarage and they were Pentecostals or free churches. And they said, can we borrow the church hall for this night of prayer that George Ingram from All Souls Langham Place is organizing? And he, he said, oh, I've got to go away and think about this in a, in a very upper-class voice. You know, well, go away. Um, and anyway, they knocked on his door a few weeks later, and he hadn't dealt with the issue. And so he was so embarrassed, he said yes, because he, <laughs> he couldn't bring himself in his Englishness to say no twice. And so he put this on. But the reason he was reluctant is because in those days, they did their personal work till about 10 o'clock at night. They'd be knocking on people's doors and just trying to lead people uh, to faith. And he was worried that he'd be too tired to pray through the night. But he was forced to. The snow was falling on the ground. It was, it was so deep, about uh, two feet high. Uh, and people still came. 30, 40 people made it there, dockers and others from Gillingham. Uh, and someone about 11 o'clock at night said, I've got to confess my sins. I've been committing adultery. And a great repentance broke out in the room. And they carried on praying. They paused for tea. I love this, I love this bit. About one o'clock in the morning, they paused for tea, probably with their pinkies out, um, probably with a cup and saucer. <laughs> and... Uh, and then about 2.40 in the morning, John was remembered, his son Dominic. And he, he remembered taking a teddy bear to his son who was in hospital and how grateful his son was before he'd even received the teddy bear because he knew his dad was bringing it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Daddy. And he's like, well, Scripture says we should be asking for the Holy Spirit in that way, uh, Luke 11. So he says, please come, Holy Spirit. And this, I believe, is the last recorded mainland revival in England. 1963, January, the spirit fell in Gillingham for about three weeks. People were converted left, right, and center. Among those there were David and uh, John Hughes, who uh, uh, David became the vicar of St. John's Harbour later on and is the father of Tim and Pete Hughes, who are uh, you know, very well-known leaders and worship, worship, Tim's a worship leader. Pete's a great leader here in London. And the impact of that night has echoed down the decades ever since. Extraordinary. But it began with weak people who didn't even want to do the meeting praying until something happened. If I was to finish with, with one thing for, for you guys here, uh, it's from in the early service. I was just imagining in my mind's eye what it was like if there were people lying on the floor here shedding tears of longing for, for God to come again through the second coming of Jesus or in the interim longing for revival. <laughs> That was the picture in my mind's eye. What would it be like if people just came and, and lay here with tears forming a small river of spiritual vitality out of which could come all the shoots the Lord wants to bring from this place in the years to come? See, we offer God our struggling to keep awake. We offer him our octogenarian knees, our fasting weak bodies, and he partners with us mightily to achieve whatever he wants to achieve. He deploys all sorts of angelic help. We see that from this book of Daniel. Most of us probably have never known that we may have entertained angels unawares or even turned them away. The battle is real, but our partners are mighty because our partners, angels, archangels, and each other know that we have the ultimate source of power and the strength of the command, the Lord rebuke you. And when we resist the enemy, what does he have to do? 
he has to flee from us. You're being tempted. No temptation sees you except what's common to man. God is faithful. He'll give you a way out. The Lord rebuke you. Suddenly you're free. You're free. We get to partner with a great God who works in the heavenly places in ways we can't even begin to imagine and rarely get a glimpse into. And the glory goes to Jesus. The glory goes to Jesus. Shall we stand and pray together in response? Maybe there are, there are different ways you want to respond to, to this message today. And I'm not going to make you linger here because we have communion, which is our great response to this message, to come to the Lord's table uh, and bow metaphorically, if not physically, at his feet and say that we're, we're nothing. We need you, Lord. But it might be as, as we just stand here in the presence of God and his angels with the communion of saints cheering us on today that there's something from the talk or the scripture or the worship that God wants to underline in your heart just now. Just be open to him now. Speak, Lord, Samuel said. Speak, Lord. What does he want to say into your heart? What does he want to remind you of? That's the role of the Holy Spirit, to remind us of everything Jesus taught us. In particular, there may be some of you who are really struck by the need to be humble. You can't imagine yourself lying on the floor in a church, but you've got a sense that that wouldn't be an inappropriate posture before the Lord of hosts. There's some who may be struck by the need to fast. You've never done it or you've given up on it years ago. But you've got the sense that the Lord's saying, this is a key to a spiritual breakthrough for you. Some of you, you're like, I'm caught up in a spiritual battle. I don't know who's going to win it. And you just need to hear him say, I always win. (laughs) Even if it's hard in the meantime. He's the king of glory. So Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus and through the power of your spirit, please seal up whatever you've taught us today that we might not leave this place without being changed by you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.